Hello, this is Lawrence R. Harvey, and you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com. Although, how you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com without your head, I, I, I simply don't know. Welcome to the Station of Decapitation Without Your Head. I'm Nasty Neal. This is Annabelle Lecter. Yes, and we're joined. We're joined. We're joined by writer, director Mark Logan, and actor and author Nicholas Vince, and they're going to tell us all about their new project, Rats. Yay! Uh, Yay! Yeah, hi guys. Nice hi. to have you back, Nicholas, and great to have you uh, for the first time, Mark. Mm-hmm. Thank you for having us. So now you guys have the Indiegogo page. It's got a lot of information on there. But for people listening here. Uh, you want to give us like a quick idea of what Rats is going to be about? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm rubbish at this moment. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Rats is a short horror film that evolved from a feature length script that I wrote last year. Uh, and it's set in a medieval castle. Um, and it follows uh, one, e- one night in the castle where a lecturer who's having an affair with one of his undergraduate students, is staying the night, uh, ostensibly to uh, record the um, the uh, very old books that they've got within their collection, but actually he's there because he wants to woo this young lady in the castle. However, there's something in the castle that feeds off lust, um, and it's a creature feature. It's all practical effects. Uh, we've got a wonderful cast and a wonderful crew, and we've got a 900-year-old medieval castle, which yes. is fairly cool. Definitely. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. So he's like a lecturer lecturer. He's a lecturer lecturer. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Lecherous lecturer. I like that. <laughs> a role that Nicholas was born to play. <laughs> no, no. I was just thinking the other day, somebody once asked me to play a nefarious doctor. Um I like. I do like a lecturous lecturer. That's, <laughs> yes, that's very cool. Mm-hmm. So, uh, how how did you get involved, uh, Nicholas? Oh, because Mark, how did I get involved? When did you ask? <laughs> <laughs> it's all so long ago. It's before Fright Fest. I know that yes. much. Anything yes. before Fright Fright Fest and five yeah. nights, five days of watching <laughs> horror movies is, is gone now. Yeah, it is. Um, Nicholas invited me on to Chattering, uh, his show, uh, to talk about um, distribution and monetization of low-budget horror movies, because I'm doing a, an MA at Raindance in London at the moment. Um, and, at the, and at the tail end of that, we were discussing ideas, and there's a project I'm working on, which is a, a portmanteau story uh, based on the railways, and it's ghost stories on the railways. Uh, and we we discussed briefly talk uh, working together, uh, and possibly Nicholas writing one of the stories. Um, that's kind of still on the back burner. But then when it came to casting rats, then Nicholas was kind of in a short list of people who I really wanted to work with. Um, it needed a little bit of tweaking on the character front, but actually I think it brings a lot more depth to the whole piece. So I was lucky to get him. Yeah. Now um, you mentioned. Uh possibly Nicholas writing uh, one of the other stories. And in your video on Indiegogo, you mentioned that uh, this is not only standalone short, but hopefully part of a a bigger or a larger world. And uh, is that the plan to make, uh, to connect these shorts into like an anthology? Um, Kind of yes. And kind of no, the kind of no is that um, the, the sort the original source material is a feature script called Haunt. Um, It's based in the castle, but it has a number of different characters. But some of the characters in Rats return, and some of the events within Rats play out on a larger scale within Haunt. Mm -hmm. Um, So so it it is all interconnected, and I've had to reverse engineer the piece so that Rats has got various things that that are being seeded ultimately for the feature. But there there is also a a direct continuation of rats that could happen, providing rats is successful and it gets great feedback, which, fingers crossed, we will do. Mm-hmm. I, I'm very interested uh, in the premise and the old castle. How did you? Uh, how did you guys? How did you come about uh, finding this castle? And uh, whoever owns the castle, I don't assume you own the castle. <laughs> let yeah, you uh, people, use it. You're right. People who own castles don't normally go around letting it out. <laughs> Certainly not to <laughs> to very low budget horror movies and horror shorts. Um, 
I, I just incredible. It's one of those things that when people in the movies say it was just luck and right people at the right time. Um, I spent a number of years as a um, half of a comedy stand up uh, called Men with Bananas, who are <laughs> well have almost been written out of the history books. Um, and my comedy partner uh, then has ended up working at the castle, and so he became the inn. Um, they also needed some, they do some Halloween stuff and they also wanted some promos doing. And so a deal was done that we could film there free of charge, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. Um, partly because of the relationship and partly because of the, the horror shorts that I'm producing for them. So it's brilliant. It's an amazing location that I would never, ever be able to afford. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and everyone who's seen it, we did a night recce with the uh, DOP and myself, uh, and I jumped and screamed that loudly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because they turned the lights off in the castle at night, um, as we were walking through, he was trying his new camera, uh, the new camera that we're going to use, which is the AS7, which can film at really low ISO. So, even in almost pitch darkness, you get a very grain free picture. And so we were walking from room to room, and of course, as your eyes are uh, acclimatised, because they've got some wax works within the castle, as we were walking into room, <laughs> your eyes are acclimatised, and you realise there's a figure between you and the window. <laughs> 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 oh, I screamed. Uh... <laughs> Where are you recording? Um, uh, I, we've recorded some of it. Um, I, th I think the behind-the-scenes footage from the actual shoot is going to be a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's the name of the DOP, Mark? Um, it. Oh, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh, oh, Nick, uh, it's Richard. But I'm going to get shot. It's. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you did this to me on purpose. I know what. <laughs> <laughs> it's Richard Bell. See, I knew it was Richard Bell. You did. Um, but he, he worked on um, Damon Rickard's The Tour with Jessica Cameron and Heather Dorff. And I really, what I really, really liked about that short was the fact that when they were in the darkness, it was actually dark and it was pitch black, with the exception of the torchlight that was kind of breaking through the darkness. And I'm a big kind of advocate. If you're going to make a, a horror film and it's at night, if I can see everything in shot, it's not scary because nothing's in the darkness. And for yeah. me, if, if you're going to film at night, you're filming because of that uh, whole idea of this primeval kind of, we're scared of what we don't know and that unknown. Yeah. And so that's what I want to do in the castle. I actually want it to be as though the lights are off. And so apart from light that's coming naturally through the windows and kind of torchlight and another kind of secondary lighting that we put on, I want it to be pitch black in places and actually part of the climax without giving it away takes place in a dungeon underground which is virtually pitch black um and that will be interesting yeah there are some interesting challenges for lighting but the dop is really excited because well he gets to play in a, a medieval castle it can't be bad uh -huh. it's definitely a different era because i uh i just watched uh vincent price pit in the pendulum and it is it totally lit you go into the dungeon and it's just the daytime yeah. lit. It's a different era, so you know, it, yeah, it's whatever. A it's, it's, it's yeah, it's and sets and yeah, and yeah. it's a wonderful movie, but the feeling is uh, mm. certain certainly a different vibe. Mm -hmm. Have yeah. you been to the castle yet, Nicholas? Not for this. Funnily enough, I have visited the castle, but okay. I'm not for this. And every time Mark, one thing Mark and I <laughs> both share. Is we're scaredy cats. Um, <laughs> Mark and I sat next to each other at Fright Fest, which is the um, five day horror film festival that just ha happened in London. Um, film for Fright. <laughs> and it's great. Nobody, because Mark was sitting next to me, he's, he's, he's bigger built than I am. I don't think people noticed how much I was jumping and screaming. Um, <laughs> I was shielding you from that that back that you were, yes, the, wor the worst stage is where I nearly wanted to just grab hold of you and hide. 
too scary. <laughs> I did take. A, I did a lot of a lot of time um, this time for Fest. They were looking at me and going, uh, and I was going, "It's not me, it's him." And they were going, no, it's you. <laughs> I, I've said this on my show, which Mark alluded to earlier on, chattering with Nicholas Woods. It is now well known that I scream more loudly than a row of 16-year-old girls. <laughs> <laughs> because I went to see the stage play of A Woman in Black, and I thought I was going to have a heart attack by the end of that thing. It was just so tense, and so I get so wound up. And just listening to Mark describing what I'm about to go through, I'm thinking, please don't let me have a heart attack. <laughs> So how do you feel about shooting in the pitch blackness? <laughs> Honestly, I, yes. I I think I probably overcame my fear of the dark when I was in my mid twenties. Okay, I, mean, I really I'm you know I grew up in uh, a place called Horsham in Sussex in the countryside, um, and you know it, uh, we lived in a very nice middle class suburban street, but you know the street lights weren't that strong and my and there wasn't that much light and I remember literally in my mid twenties having to walk having to dare myself to cross the twelve feet from my bedroom door to the lounge in the dark without putting the light on. So I I do get yeah, it's gonna be really interesting <laughs> <laughs> and scary. Yes, yes. Uh, real quick, too, uh, how, I'm sure most people listening know, but how, how would you find uh, Chattering with Nicholas Vince? How did I find it? Uh, how, or... how, how would uh, people listening uh, find it? Oh, how do people yeah. <laughs> I was going yeah. to find walking into my study. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Ta-da! Ta-da! Yeah, it's... You can't all walk into your study now. Yeah. And what a coinc... <laughs> and it was a great coincidence that it was named Chattering with Nicholas Vince when you found it. Yeah, um, the, the easiest way is via the website, um, www.nicholasevents.com, or on YouTube, if you just look for, you know, if you type in search Nicholas Vince, you'll come across my channel. Um, if you want to, I mean, the great thing about chattering with Nicholas Vince um, is that when I do the live shows, I really encourage people to come on and chat with the guests as well, because um, it is possible, of, because they are a thing called a Google Hangout. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got the right setup, which is basically the same as for a Skype call, um, people can actually come on and join the show, which is always really interesting because people people come up with far more interesting questions than I rec I do, I reckon. Um, and, I, and I know you guys have interactive and uh, shows as well when you're doing stuff live. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, just go go to the website, go to my uh, or Google me. Actually, if you, I discovered if you Google chattering with Nicholas events, it takes you straight to the YouTube page. Mm, excellent. And that's every Sunday? Is it every Sunday or every... It's most Sundays. To be. <laughs> the great thing is I took, uh, I took August off because yeah. um, I, uh, it's like I needed a break. Um, mm -hmm. And I knew I was going to be filming two short films, um, with, uh, one with Katie Bonham and uh, called Mindless, and one called Remnant with Andy Stewart. Um, and there'll be news about them going into, uh, into festivals fairly soon. Um, I've got two shows set up. I'm just trying to, sh to uh, set up the third show for September, and then I'm going to have to take a week off because I'm filming with Mark. Yay! <laughs> Yay! That's a good reason, though. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice because when you have an audience, they tend to understand. Yeah, yeah. Develop, I mean, and they're like, okay, do your thing. <laughs> or maybe, Nick, we could do it live from the castle. We yeah. Could, if you've got Just a really sword. good, strong Wi-Fi connection. Or, you know, I could wonder <laughs> about that. It, but I don't want to interfere with your shooting schedule. Oh, um, that'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Candice, got... uh, Candice, our producer, will shoot you for saying that, Mark. Candice, that wasn't me. That was someone else speaking on my behalf. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I mean, if we can, I mean, it'd be interesting to see if we. Because I love the idea of doing it from. Because then I have a chance to chat with uh, cast and crew and so on. So if we can do, if basically if they've got an Ethernet cable uh, free and I've got that, my laptop with me, I'm sure we could do this, and it would be really, really good fun to do it from. I can't imagine it. That would be very good fun, actually. 
Yeah. All right. So everybody listening to the show live, it's totally happening. Yeah, absolutely. Right. <laughs> Tune in. <laughs> Mark will make this happen. Yeah, we'll you. find a way. Yep. <laughs> Even if I'm being <laughs> shot by the producer at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> live on Nicholas's show. <laughs> Well, if you're going to get shot, it might as well be for a good cause. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And if she wants to shoot me, she'll have to make a donation to the crowd for the <laughs> I'll put it on as a perk. Oh, yes, that's what I was about to say. <laughs> that would be a very cool perk. <laughs> well, thanks, Nick. A direct headshot at the end of filming. <laughs> so it can be to be the person who shoots you, and it can be funning towards that yes. demand. Yes. Weaponry, perhaps, doesn't have to be a gun. No, this is true. Across, there's yeah. a lot of weapons. And there's a dungeon, so yeah. There's, <laughs> there's all kinds of good stuff that could happen. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Well, I want to mention there is the Indiegogo campaign, and I'll have the link on the website, and there's a lot of cool perks, as you mentioned. Uh, you want to tell some the people some of the cool perks? Yeah, um, we've got uh, the normal perks that you would normally get with most crowdfunding campaigns, you can get the DVD, you can get signed posters, signed by all of the cast, including Nick and Lawrence. Um, you can also get there are some of the other perks. I've put up my Rats Bible. Every time I do a, um, a movie, I create a kind of hardback Bible, which is all of the influences visually for the creature. It's got influences for um, the sets and which locations within the set we're using. It's got original script that now are no longer being used because we have to cut it down, which gives a lot of the backstory of the creature, which otherwise you wouldn't be able to find anywhere else. So basically you'll get everything I will be taking on set with me to be able to create the film. You'll get a hardback copy of that, and it's the only one in the world. I'll no longer own it if anyone has that perk. Um, but hey, it's cool if somebody wants it. Mm -hmm. um, we've just put on an extra perk today, which is... Um, uh, Two of the creature's prosthetic hands are up as a perk, um, which are being made by Paul Weil, who's our FX genius, uh, who created the absolutely incredible feature effect on the short film She. Um, if you, you guys have seen that, if you haven't, you should really find it out. Um, it's an excellent little movie. Um, and so we've put that on today. Uh, people can become executive producer. People can become associate producer. Um, there are one or two other things. We had breakfast. We had some people who came for breakfast with Nicholas and some of the rest of the cast and crew during Fright Fest, but obviously that's gone now. So unless people are prepared to wait for 12 months, I'm afraid, that's gone. Unless Nicholas <laughs> is going to cook some fried eggs and we'll all pop round to Nick's for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> So if I take that, will you give us room and board? <laughs> <laughs> the flight? <laughs> the fly us out there for a nice breakfast. As always with those the perks, there'll be a, a sub clause underneath. Dog. No accommodation or travel provide. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, so I think we've got some really cool perks. Um, it's excellent. Um, I think we're up to about 43% funded now. Um, so, touch wood, we seem to be getting there. And I have to say that your perks are very reasonably priced. Sometimes they're not. This is it's very good. You get a lot you get a lot for your money. We've tried to keep it low because I, I, ultimately it's it's difficult times for a lot of people. And yeah. and what I've said to everybody whether they've been able to donate or whether they've been able to just help us publicize the actual campaign and and retweet and stuff is whatever you do. If you do anything, as far as I'm concerned, you're a part of Team Rats. You're part of this team that are creating th this movie, and you have some ownership of that movie. Not literally, you're not going to get paid. Well, then, then again, who is? <laughs> but, um, we can get paid in entertainment. Exactly. <laughs> but, but actually, you know, it's really important to me that everybody who's contributed in any way, shape, or form feels that they're part of the process and feels that they're going to be updated and they're going to hopefully invest in the film. And when that film actually does come out and goes on the festival circuit, they're actually going to go, actually, I want to go and see that because I helped make that film. Mm -hmm. You, uh, The idea short itself, it seems like that's a popular thing lately that people, you know, uh, enjoy the shorts. And then there's also the anthology films, which uh, have, have made a comeback. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I personally I love anthologies. I, I really love anthologies. My this project had it not been rats, as I say, was going to be an anthology. Um, and even now, there is the possibility that rats could potentially fit within an anthology set in and around the castle, um, rather than going to the feature. As always, the feature will come down to funding. Mm. Um, it's a big commitment getting people to work for kind of three weeks uh, on a, a micro budget or very low budget movie. Everyone's got work. Everyone's got you know mortgages or rent to pay. Um, so it's a big it's a big ask. Whereas doing kind of three or four shorts and then combining them and making them into a portmanteau movie. I'm a huge fan of the Amicus sixties and seventies stuff. Um, and and again, they're moralistic tales. And I feel that Rats is kind of along that line. It's a cautionary tale of what can happen to you, and that you know there is a cause and effect going on. Um, and I like that. I, I like that in those old movies, those Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing films of the sixties mm-hmm. and seventies. The int- I I, I um, very deliberately made sure I got to see at least two of the screening of the sessions of short films at Fright Fest, mm-hmm. um, and, and I think it's a really interesting form. As Mark says, it's the sort of thing that you can ask people to do, you know, largely for favours. Um, just to get excited, you know, it's exciting. In fact, I'm um, working on writing and directing my own now. Um, more on that later, um, <laughs> once I've actually got things in place. Um, but I'm working on a couple of those at the moment. And it, it's like writing short stories. I think it's a very interesting art form to be able to deliver something that will last 5, 10, 15 minutes but actually really involve the audience and make them care about characters. And, and to be able to communicate a story in that short time, I think is very cha- challenging. Um, it was one of the things that was said about the, intro- the introduction for one of the short film, uh, short film ses- sessions at Fright Fest. To be able to deliver that when you don't have the luxury of 90 minutes to tell your story and really get to know people and so on, to actually be able to get people to care about your characters is challenging, and I think makes it a very interesting art form. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Uh, and there's sometimes, um, uh, sometimes there's uh, movies where you you'll watch them; they're ninety minutes, and there's a good story in it. But sometimes it seems like it's padded out to be a feature, and uh, sometimes you think they could actually be improved if they were cut down. Yeah, no, I, I think we. Yeah, I think. Yes, I think there was one or two of those at the festival. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can think of one you're thinking of next. <laughs> I can think of what I'm thinking of. In, yeah, absolutely. You just think, mm. yeah, you got halfway through and you really didn't know what to do. <laughs> you just get the catch. <laughs> Actually, they literally repeated shots. Wow. They, they literally <laughs> repeated shots. <laughs> they did that with a lot of cartoons in the 80s. They just play like a loop. Yeah. Whatever was going on, and just reused frames. So that's these, these are really talented people. You just think, oh gosh, what did you do? Just run out yeah. of it or whatever. Um, it's like they 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 needed to make an eighty minute movie, and they ended up making a sixty four minute movie, and wow. so they repeat stuff in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> Again, yeah. are they flashback scenes or? It yeah, wasn't really was clear great. what they were. <laughs> <laughs> they were there. Yeah. <laughs> they happened. <laughs> and, 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 and to be, you know, and, and it's okay, you know, it's really easy to denigrate somebody out. You know, making a movie is hard. Mm-hmm. I have such respect for anybody who manages to get a film completed. You know, it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's a year of somebody's life at least yeah. to actually, you know, to do that. And I, and I, and I completely respect that there are um uh budgetary reasons or whatever reasons for doing it and of course it's very interesting to me at least I, you have novels you have short stories and i think it's very easy to make the comparison between a novel uh, being a full length a feature and a uh, a short film but in the literary world you have novellas you don't really have anything that's between a short film and a feature film Mm-hmm. Yeah. In terms of an art form, you, you know, unless it's a TV program, a mm-hmm. one-off 
TV, something of 57, 60 minute program. That doesn't really exist. Um, yeah. You know, particularly on the festival, people sit down to watch a short film or a collection of short films, or they sit down to watch a feature film. But it's not often you actually sit down unless it's part of a TV series. Which is so great, have... but at the same time, usually there's this continuity thing where you're going to see the next show. Yeah. So you know you've got that to work with. Do you think that will change um, in film in general? I, horror, I think is, there's so much experimentation going on right now, and people, I think, are really open-minded to change. Uh, do you see that changing, either of you? I do. Um, I, I've um, As part of my MI, I was doing a lot of research into what people are doing and because the old the old model of you make a movie you sell territories to for, for dvd and blu-ray in different countries it is it, most people now admit that it's pretty much dying on its feet there's still a lot of money to be made at the moment but it's going down and down and that seems to be the trajectory looking at that then then the question becomes if you can no longer get your film realistically if if i made a, a micro budget horror movie this year or next year, the chance of me getting a cinema distribution are so slim as to almost not work, not be worth it even investigating. Unless yeah. you happen to be that paranormal activity and you just have that, you hit at the right time and, and a, a studio comes in and essentially buys you out. That's the only way you're going to hit a cinema. So the reason for making a, a cinema-length film starts reducing. And once you're no longer selling DVDs and Blu-rays, Again, the reason for having that feature length film is kind of reducing. And I, I've kind of, I'm very interested in this idea that what Nick's talking about, which is the version of a novella, yeah. weird, the, the first version of Rats would have run to about 50 minutes, which isn't a feature and isn't a short. The problem is currently festivals don't really have slots for anything that isn't 20 minutes or under or isn't 75 minutes or longer. I think that will eventually change. And I yeah. think a lot of people are playing with the format with kind of web series. And I think people will play with the format. And all it will require is for people who have actually already got a name and a status within the industry to say, actually, I'm making this 50 minute short, this 50 minute novella or whatever the, sh the version of the film title will be. Um, and do you want it in your festival? And I think, you know, if, if one of the big heavyweight names in the genre, was to come in and do that, then I think maybe the genre, maybe the festivals would be much quicker to react to, to different length films. But currently, everyone said to me, you can't make a 50-minute or a 45-minute short. No one will show it in a festival. Which is interesting because I think it's something, you know, we're all talking about this and I think all of us feel positive about this idea. And Neil said, sometimes things are too long and everybody knows you can't cram everything into a short. I would think public demand especially at festivals, because you're sitting there, like you guys, you sit there, and here's your time going by, and you know something's dragging out, and then what do you do? And I, I would think in the festival circuit that would be perfect, because you, you could still probably keep those other two, but then there just seems like this lovely length of time that's just right. I think I think yeah. it's it's interesting. It depends what the how the festival is organised and the size of the festival. I think the thing with Fright Fest, for, for instance, is you've got many screens, you've got discovery screens, so you've got to get people in a block watching a film, and then to get the next film, you've got to you know juggle things and so on. It's, it's tremendously complex. I think with some of the smaller festivals where basically you've got one screen yeah. and you're just showing things on the, you know, on the big main screen, then you can play around with things more. And, you know, if you took two 40 minutes, that's 80 minutes. That's a, that's a feature length. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it would be possible that uh, then you can find those as well. So I, I, I think it's going to take a while to change. And it's that chicken and egg situation. Until somebody starts making them, yeah. then somebody's, you know, nobody's going to want to schedule yeah. them and, and so on. So I think it's going to take a while to happen. Yeah, that's what I was thinking when you guys were explaining. It's like uh, people don't make them because there's no place to show them necessarily. And there's no place to show them necessarily because people don't make them. Yeah. But also, yeah. I, I, although Mark did mention, uh, funny enough, I was, just before we came on this call, I uh, 
I was watching something that I learned about over the weekend, um, which is a web series. Now, the episodes are 20 minutes, and they're only unlocking the next episode once they've got a certain number of views for the previous episode. And they seem to be doubling up each time. So you have to, you know, you've got to convince, if you want to see the next episode, you're going to have to go in and invite your mates to watch it. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the ones that you've got so far. Which I thought was a very interesting marketing method. Mm -hmm. method. Um, but again, it's, you know, it's like a series of 20 minute short films. Um, but it'd be interesting to see if people are going to be, you know, want to put this up, there are, I was learning at the Fright Fest, there are distribution deals. I've got, there was one of those short films that I sh saw at uh, Fright Fest that is going to be available on uh, Shorts and iTunes and Amazon at the beginning of December. Hmm. Now that's not, I think, no, 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 it's probably about 12, 15 minute film um, from, from my memory of it. It's very good as well as a thing called The Alpha Invention. Um, I do recommend it. Um, so I think it is very fluid, what Mark was saying. You know, the, the, the market is, is changing, and people are now finding new ways of distributing movies and making money out of them as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a friend, of, a friend of the show, Blair Bathory, has uh, Fear House, which is a great uh, uh, web series that has uh, short films, usually between like 8 and 20 minutes. Yeah, I, I've interviewed Blair on Chattering with Nicholas Vince, mm -hmm. uh, a lovely lady. Yeah. Um, but also, uh, not only that, she chooses good movies, and she does really, really cool introductions as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. She, she's really, she really stepped into a wonderful situation with that. It just feels like that. I encourage that all the time. It's just such a great format, and that she really believes in what she's doing. And I mean, I guess everybody does to a degree, but. I just I feel like that's going to really do well. I think that's going to, and she's currently curating the film festival at Spooky Empire. Yes. Um, so I'm really interested to see what, and I know she's looking for stuff at the moment. So I'm really interested to see what she uh, what she finds. And I don't know whether or not I will be there to find out. But hopefully, <laughs> you know, some of the stuff that she actually shows at Spooky Empire will then feed into the Fear House um, stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, back to rats. I wanted to uh, ask because uh, when I was reading there, he said that it's going to also be darkly uh, funny, and um, <laughs> we've always talked yeah. on the show about uh, I. We always think that movies that are that are like uh, a horror comedy, for them to work, they also have to be really scary. And so I was glad that yeah. you brought up both that it's scary and it's going to be humorous. So, uh, would you call it a uh, a horror comedy, or is it just going to be a horror that happens to have some? Uh, comedy in it i it, yeah it, that's kind of an interesting call um if you'd have asked me a couple of years ago what this was i'd have said a horror comedy but there seems to be a bit of a backlash against horror comedy to which i would say to people well what about reanimator what about evil dead 2 what about fright night i mean yeah <laughs> dead alive. Of, you know exactly you know brain dead dead alive i mean it, there's so many great films that you could say a horror comedy um i would say this one leans further towards being a, a horror a, well a terror picture really I, i'm very keen on kind of building up the dread um but there's some i think there are some potentially great little moments of humor because for me when i'm watching the best horror movies i ever watch are the ones where i can i i can be terrified one minute and the next minute I can laugh at something because it releases that and allows it. Definitely. It's almost like your body um, can like re reset and yeah. then go back into, you know, tension headache. Because, yeah. you know, it, for me, I'm not as, I'm not, I don't find it that enjoyable to watch 90 minutes and come out with a tension headache. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I like more roller coaster type horror movies that are scary, but then can also make you guffaw in the next minute. But then in the next minute, you're holding onto the seat, the arms of the seat again. And that's so true because even in uh, just an average non-comedic horror film like Halloween, you yeah. have scenes that are calm comparatively. They're yeah. not necessarily funny, but you've got that, like you mentioned, this recovery time where your body is able to, that you might still, you know something's still going to happen, but you have that time to, to bring it back. And I think that's, you know, perfect. The roller coaster of emotion 
it makes I think it makes the horror parts have more punch when you keep having to recover. Yeah. And then go back. And even, I, I think, even sorry, go on Nick. I, I was gonna say I think you have to woo an audience. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if you just walk up to an audience and slap them around the face, they tend to recoil and then you know they may lose interest oh, yeah, and, and they start stepping back. Yeah. Um, I'll you. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, 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 you've got to uh, the old writer's adage that I always come back to is make them laugh, make them cry, make them wait. And it, I think I think that's really true of any storytelling. You by by bringing humor in to begin with, you know, it, or you know, or, or early in your movie, it entices the audience to care about the characters. Because if yeah. you can laugh with a character, then you're kind of invested in that character. You want to know what happens to them, and you want to find out. And if you then put them into a threatening situation, you're going to care about them. Very think, true. You know that is the the important. It's so important that you care about the characters. You know, just watching somebody get cut up without really caring about them. Mm-hmm. And there's an audience for that, but oh, yeah. I would think it's much if you're if you're a storyteller. And you're not just in it for, you know, I'm just going to make this crazy film. And there's people that want that crazy film. But there's a difference between really telling a story and just throwing a bunch of stuff out there. Mm. It still takes effort. It still takes work to make that film. But it's, I would rather watch the story film myself. I I prefer that. Those are the ones that, that stay with you. Yeah, you know the, the the story the story films and the the, the story sequence. I'm suddenly thinking of the, you know the beginning of Scream. Yeah, you know you 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 know who your star is at the beginning of Scream, and yeah. she's there and she's in this really. Oh, hold on! I recognise the situation. This could be me. You know that you know that mm-hmm. left in the house by yourself, and you got the creepy phone caller. You know, that's. But there's still a little bit of humor there, and it's quickly, quickly, quickly builds up the tension. You care about the characters, and those things stay with you. I, I just want to mention because I'm a huge fan of uh, Frankenstein, and I love that uh, you keep uh, the creature's identity uh, a mystery, and the creature itself <laughs> is very mysterious at the moment. Yeah, it was. It's actually it's um, the 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 they were going. To create the creature, there's multiple um, versions. We've we've got the prosthetic on an actor, but also we've got a full size puppet, um, which is the same height as the actor. Um, wow! Which is good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There went the budget. There went the budget. <laughs> yeah, practical effects, and then you go. Now I know why they do CGI. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you heard about Nicholas stumbling stumbling around the set of Hellraiser without being able to see where he was going? Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks it's not for time it. to trade out. <laughs> <laughs> now you can laugh at this guy. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> so uh, the, the actor, the actor who's playing the creature, the the, the when he's wearing the prosthetics. He he actually said, "I don't I don't want you to announce who it is. I don't want you to announce who I am." And I was and initially I was like, "Well, why? I'm I'm announcing everybody else as they come on board." And he and he was like, "It's a I've always been a huge fan of Frankenstein." And the minute he said Frankenstein, I went the question mark, and he went mm-hmm. yes, and I went okay. So the only time it will be announced who the creature is is at the end credits. When when we'll do a a good cast is worth repeating mm-hmm. <laughs> in our homage to Frankenstein, um, but yeah, the Frankenstein at the beginning where they said the creature and it was just question mark on the original nineteen thirty one Frankenstein is is kind of it's a little homage. It's mm-hmm. I love the idea because it's like I like I like that whole idea of like wow who's the creature what who's inside that thing who's making it move and it's like yeah I like having a little bit of mystery so it's quite a quite quirky and I liked it. <laughs> yeah, I like it a lot too. And it's hard to, uh, you know, in the internet age, it's hard to keep anything, you know, a uh, mystery. Yeah. Well, if yeah, if I'd have had my way, I'd have already kind of released some of some a bit more of the promo art for the creature. Uh, mm. And again, uh, on pain of death from the producer, uh, <laughs> I'm now not doing that. So I'm I'm I will be sending out everybody who um, who commits to a perk will be getting a JPEG of kind of some of the advanced. Um, uh, 
creature artwork that we've kind of used to base the creature on. Um, but And that'll be after we've finished the crowdfunder. Mm-hmm. But I won't be kind of posting it out on the internet. But, of course, once it's out there, it's probably going to get out there. But I, I think it's important to kind of tease people and have stuff in reserve that people aren't expecting, even on a short. I think you can kind of easily say, here's our creature. We're making a practical creature. Look how cool it is. Mm-hmm. And maybe we'd have got we'd have got some more pledges doing it that way. But actually, there's something really nice about people going, I'm buying into this. I kind of know it's in a castle, but I don't know where it is. I, <laughs> I, I know there's this really cool cast, but they haven't all been announced yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I know there's a creature. I don't know who's playing it. And I don't know what the creature looks like. So there's kind of this, there's still a, we've got some stuff in store that, you know, only when you sit in front of, in a darkened cinema and watch it and hopefully do what I do and leap out my seat six feet in the air, um, <laughs> <laughs> we then go, damn, that's what they were keeping. <laughs> well, it's really interesting, too, because I know I've seen um, other shorts and other people doing crowdfunders, and you don't know enough. And it's and like you're talking about the challenge of not being able to show things, but at the same time, the film is called Rats, and we know what rats look like. And I think it helps because a person can use their imagination. There have been other movies that involve stuff with rats, and we've seen them in Halloween and all that stuff. So I think that's kind of cool because it's almost like, well, I think it could look like this, uh, or this could one, happen. There's only one problem with that. Mm. There's no rats in the film. There's no rats at all, ever? <laughs> at all, ever, ever? <laughs> I had this conversation with Mark. <laughs> Not ever? <laughs> Will you pu- put a couple in in a corner? <laughs> That'll be the I'll just have guy. them squeak once in a while. Just for Nick, An ominous it? squeaking. <laughs> See, I think you're setting yourself up for a fall. Mark, you know, <laughs> people are instantly going to be disappointed. It's like, it says rats on the poster and then no rats. It says a lot of rats. Mm. Rats is a, it happens a lot in this. In, yeah. in, in the actual wording, I see rats. Yeah. Rats. Rats. yeah Just a couple happen. squeaking. <laughs> well, yes, that's cheap. You'll hear a lot of scratching. <laughs> Snoring. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The rodent Mark aficionados just... will be very upset. They'll be like, I, I came to see this for the rats. and false <laughs> They stand up. I'm out. No, I think what we'll do is we'll film a post credit sequence and just at the end we'll just have the last shot of the castle with a rat running across the screen. <laughs> yeah. Mark and I were actually discussing this at Fright Fest. We reckon one way around this is that, you know, in the James Bond movie, is you have all these wonderful ladies floating around yeah. with flames and guns and so on. Mm-hmm. I think we should do something similar with rats for yeah. this. <laughs> Rather than having kind of all these kind of um, new bowl ladies from the 60s kind of waving their arms in the air and, and projecting onto them, mm-hmm. we, we're kind of thinking maybe Nicholas and Lawrence could kind of do a little... <laughs> That's not what project I rats onto them as they dance. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Nick, did I not mention that? In no, the... you didn't. <laughs> it be a title <laughs> sequence with silhouettes of rats. Yes. I was really yeah. looking forward to it before, but now I'm definitely going to see it. <laughs> it's the idea of, of the dancing and the projection of rats over people, isn't it? It is, indeed. <laughs> He'll have sold. He will, he will definitely keep that for his home collection. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just watch it in a loop. But the... <laughs> I'll just pop that on just once more. I <laughs> uh, just mentioned Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence Harvey will be uh, in the film. Uh, Lawrence has been on the show many times. We're friends with Lawrence. How did uh, Lawrence get involved? Um, again, he was... Um, actually, he was always my number one choice for the big bad in the feature. Um, and so, initially, I was kind of in two minds... Um, our producer Candice uh, had worked. She produced Banjo uh, for Liam Regan, and uh, which is a great film. If you get a chance to see it, it was superb at Fright Fest. Um, and uh, Lawrence worked on that. Um, he was one of the cast, so she'd kind of mooted maybe Lawrence might be interested in getting on board. And I really wanted him, but I was in two minds because of this idea of well, actually, in the feature. I already really, really wanted him for the big bad in the feature. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so yeah, some reverse engineering later, and yeah, it was like that works in my head, and therefore yes, we can go ahead. So contacted Lawrence, and yeah, he was up for it. So brilliant. I mean, how how better how much better can it be than having Lawrence and having Nick? I mean, and then uh, yesterday we were joined by Jessica Messenger, um, and I think we got a superb cast, far better than I deserve. <laughs> <laughs> And Nick never paid me to say that. <laughs> no. no <laughs> what are your bank details again, Mark? <laughs> I told you, Nick, you, you've already emptied it. There's nothing left. <laughs> He'll keep it on tap for the future. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when I get shot. <laughs> the pledge money comes in. <laughs> Uh, you guys mentioned uh, Fright Fest a few times. Um, I know conventions are, are huge here in the United States. Uh, are they starting to get uh, more popular over there? Um, Fr- Fright Fest is the biggest one by far in the UK. Um, one, one of the biggest ones in Europe, but it's certainly the biggest one in the UK. Um, uh, and it's five days now. I mean, I first went on, I think it was its fourth or fifth year, uh, and now it's on 16th, um, and it's five, five days, and I think they played a uh, hundred and something movies over that period of time. Wow. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, it's wonderful. And it's, uh, it may be hundred with short films, but I think it was about 70. Maybe was just it? Just 70 oh, okay. features. Right. That's a lot. But, yeah, yeah. It, this is what... So everyone actually had a different experience because not you couldn't possibly see you couldn't physically see no. all the films yeah. that were being shown, um, and of course it's very much a film festival rather than a horror convention. If yeah. that's what you were thinking about, Neil, yeah. um, this is very much you know you go to in, and use. What time do we start? We usually start at around about ten forty-five in the morning, yeah. and left the following morning. If you yeah. saw the late night film. Um, <laughs> It's pretty intense, and I think they're going to have a, a an all nighter around ha- Halloween. Uh, yeah, they do. About yeah. yeah, they do um, an all night all night Halloween, and uh, they do two two nights at the Glasgow Film Festival in February. So they do three events a year. That's pretty awesome. The uh, length of time, because uh, yeah, it's different from a convention. But if you compare it to anything over here. It's, there really it, isn't anything there. I think everything we've got is pretty much a three day weekend in terms of conventions. But of course you've got scream fest in LA, which That's I think true. is nearly two weeks. Um, cause I was looking at possibly being over and, and at the beginning of October in Los Angeles, you've got scream fest wow. where I think they're showing about three or four films a day over a two week period. Wow. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think Fright Fest is, uh, it really works. I mean, some people want it to be longer, and I, I'm kind of in that camp. But for most of the festival, you're looking at six films a day, uh, features, that is. Um, plus, they've started putting other stuff on, like parties and karaoke. I do a bit of a... <laughs> 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 I've been Neil and I are fans. Yes, are. Lawrence yeah. is also a fan, uh-huh. if you're not aware of that. Yeah, I have some video of Lawrence at karaoke. I don't think I've ever yeah. posted them, but I, ha- I have them. Singing though, or was it more about no, ladies you're singing. dancing all you're... over him with cake? No, no that, that was a totally different event. But uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Mark did a very good karaoke. I wasn't there because I, I, I avoid karaoke. Um, just too loud, too noisy, <laughs> and I can't do it uh, to save my life. I uh, cannot sing karaoke. Um, but Mark did a very, and I believe, are you going to put it up as a perk, Mark, it's, or as um, a thank you? Yeah. The, as a joke, for the last week, <laughs> this coming weekend, there will be a free extra perk for anyone who, who, who donates, which will be a link to the video of me at Fright Fest uh, singing Bad Out of Hell for karaoke. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> which, thankfully, a number of people decided to record on the phones. I... <laughs> <laughs> it must have been a site. It was a site. Um, it's good, it was certainly that. <laughs> <laughs> did you miss your calling as an actor? Uh, I, did, I used to be. I was initially. I trained as an actor back in the early nineties, um, and I, I was as a kind of a rotund but six foot rotund guy in his early twenties. I was basically told at the end of going to drama school, 
uh, no one's going to cast you for 20 <laughs> years, go away and come back in 20 or 30 years and you'll get character work. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a bit gutsing. You kind of do the expenses going. Could you have told me that before you actually rolled me? Where they got your money? No, no, no. They could not. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I kind of. It, I was actually acting on a genre film just this week. Um, oh. Kate Shenton, who did um, the feature documentary uh, on Tender Hooks, her her first narrative feature is called Ego Maniac. Uh, and that's just wrapped. And uh, I was doing some uh, some extra scenes because she, as, as we were talking about earlier, she uh, started editing and got down to about sixty eight minutes or something. So I ended up having to put in another seven minutes of of scenes and stuff. So um, and yeah, my scene is is my homage, probably the only one I'll ever get chance to do to singing in the rain, uh, <laughs> no, that which sounds is beautiful. a genre movie. Quite a bloody genre movie, which Lawrence is actually in that as well. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Lawrence is making the rounds. I'm very happy for him. He had a dark time right after Human Centipede, too. I, I, would, I would imagine so. A lot of people a lot of people watch that film thinking, oh, this might be fun, and then had a dark time after Human Centipede. <laughs> 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 I've known people to sit there open mouthed afterwards and going, Oh. Yeah, I would suggest you sat there closed mouthed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> now I just no. I did want to tell Nicholas that uh I can't sing either, but it doesn't stop me from uh doing karaoke. That... <laughs> no, it's just painful and embarrassing when I do karaoke. I can actually sing. I've actually got a very oh, good right. singing I've got a decent singing voice, so I reckon. You don't belong at karaoke at all. <laughs> no, that, I, it's always in the wrong key as far as I'm concerned it's, I've never understood it's never in the key I expect it to be and it's just like, no it's just not a pleasant experience for anyone involved with me singing karaoke <laughs> sounds like a good time to me that's what karaoke is <laughs> are, you not, are you not getting the well, concept well, no, it's I'm, a bunch you, of people making asses of themselves I, and everybody laughs at each other you, I believe I believe the key is that Nicholas doesn't drink yeah so, you see, this, <laughs> you're, you're probably absolutely right Neil this yes. probably has an awful lot to do with it I, <laughs> I remember going to a karaoke it was, it was in San Francisco in the 19 oh sometime in the 1990s I think um, I was in San Francisco and I went to a gay bar and they had karaoke and everybody was pitch perfect. I mean, you know, they'd obviously rehearsed. It was like watching Glee. It was just like, <laughs> this is the way I'm standing up. These guys, no, they they really take this stuff seriously. Mm. Um, I thought, no, I, I, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> It was, uh, I think it was Mad Monster, and uh, I was gonna do, Ma I was gonna do um, Monster Mash, and right before me, they, ha it was uh, someone did, uh, it was a, someone was like a, I don't say professional, but they do Frankenfurter all the time, and so they did like this amazing performance of uh, Sweet Transvestite, and I'm thinking, I can't follow that. I encourage you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, you, with vodka. That's why I thought, you know, that's probably why uh, Nicholas Sorry? doesn't. <laughs> It's hard to believe sometimes I, Neil actually needs encouragement to act like an ass. <laughs> now, do you, do you see, that's something that didn't end up on the Nightbreed director's cut, as far as I'm aware. I don't think it's on the extras. But we recorded Monster Mash oh, with oh. the cast of Nightbreed. Um, oh. They did it as, as a surprise for Clive. I don't think he was really amused at the time because it was the end of the film. <laughs> that we'd, we'd, he was practically dead by the end of filming of, of Nightbreed and, and it was not a pleasant experience for him at the end. But there, somewhere, I think it might even appear, a bit of it may have appeared on the internet recently, but somewhere there is footage of the cast and crew of, Monst of Nightbreed doing Monster Mash. Um, That's awesome. Uh, dancing and singing along to Monster Mash. It's a graveyard smash. That sounds... Yeah, that's silly. <laughs> well, just because I was working in my lab late one night when my eyes beheld an eerie sight. <laughs> that was awesome. You see the karaoke. <laughs> so yeah. the first one and leave before everybody gets too insane. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and now, unfortunately, I've got this image of Clive sitting in a, in a director's chair, just, just <laughs> set jaw, staring at all these guys who got to the going, please end. <laughs> white knuckled on the chair. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I'm sure you've been asked this, but uh, when, when they just put out the... Uh, the, the director's cut, or I, for, I forget what the official term because there's been different director's cut, but of uh, of the new night of uh, Nightbreed, uh, what were your thoughts on that, Nicholas? The director's cut. It's not, I mean, basically, a very brief history of that. So basically, you have the Cabal cut, mm -hmm. which is what Russell Cherrington put together with uh, found footage and VHS terms and eighties porn quality uh, <laughs> in many of the scenes um, where he splice together some VHS and DVD. The director's cut is what is where they actually found the original material. Mm -hmm. um, and they spliced together, and that was done under Clive's supervision um, and uh, uh, produced by Mark Miller. Uh, I was there in Los Angeles last year when that was screened in Los Angeles uh, with Clive there, and it was very moving. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's, it's the movie that I kind of read in a script. I read in a script yeah. before we made it. Um, it goes up back to being a love story, basically. I love it. I, it is really great. And one of the other things, of course, that's just happened recently that also happened at Fright Fest was they've just done a high resolution version of Hellraiser, um, which is coming out from Arrow as part wow. of the box set with the first three movies. Um, so I was at. Um, one of the reasons I missed a whole load of short films is because I was introducing Hellraiser. Um, and that's, that's extraordinary as well. I'm very excited about that because it's not just the picture quality, it's the sound quality. Yeah. Um, it's just amazing. I, when Frank and Julia make love in Hellraiser, um, there's always been this sh 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 noise going on in the background as far as I could hear. I was only, I, it was only when I saw it on the big screen and heard it properly for the first time, they're actually saying, Julia, 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 you've got these repeating voices. And I'd never really heard it before, um, except possibly on the first, first screening. Certainly through none of the VHS and DVDs versions of it, I'd never really caught that before. Um, so that's... It's a, I, I, I think it's wonderful that we get, you know, we get the chances to see stuff. And it's amazing because... I'm at 2K, the prosthetic makeup still stands up pretty well. Um, they've done a very good job of the restoration. Um, I've had Jeff Portis, um, who created Pinhead, uh, message me about it. He said, can you see any edges? Can you see any edges? <laughs> <laughs> and you can't. You, you know, it, it's obviously latex. It's not silicone. Um but it, I think the thing is with Hellraiser, of course, it is just what you know. Winding back to the conversation we had earlier on, the reason that Hellraiser stands up so well is because it has got a story there. Yeah, you know, it's a domestic drama with monsters, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, um, and it has got humour in it. Uh, you know, there are some laugh, some good laughs at the beginning of Hellraiser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an amazing story, and really. Uh... Uh, sometimes you know people call them the pinhead movies or whatever, but they're so much more than uh, to the movie than 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 the uh, than the set of bites. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's it's a story of a love triangle. Um, you know, Larry and and Frank and, and Julia, uh, in many ways, but also about you know obsession and love, etc. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why you know we're still talking about you know, about it. 30, it's going to be 30 years next year since we made it. Wow. So it's the 29th anniversary just around about now of when we made it. Um, so we made it in 19... Yeah, so 30 years since we made it, and then another year, and 30 years since it was released. So. And it's interesting because you can see the clothes and all that are, are dated, but that story mm. really, as you know, it's that... It's a story that could be told really in any era more or less because of the uh domestic drama part as you put it yeah and, and but also that i think the great thing about it of course is julia yeah this is which is why clive wanted to um uh i think it originally thought that he was creating the femme the ultimate femme fatale 
in Julia. And again, watching it, watching Julia's transformation, um, it I one of the things I love about Hellraiser is the three character actors who play the victims. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's part of the genius of Hellraiser, as far as I'm concerned, um, is those is those actors who come in and and those scenes between Julia and the act, uh, and the victims. Uh, when she starts bringing them back, in, in fact, something that came out again, watching it again on the big screen in the in this um, um, high definition version from Arrow is the fact when Julia brings the first victim whole, uh, home, they stand on the threshold between light and darkness, literally. Yeah. Hesitating, is is she going to go through with it, or is she going to bottle out at the last minute? Mm -hmm. But, you know, and it's beautifully lit, beautifully shot. And I really, I, I've forgotten that I don't think you can really appreciate it on the, without seeing it on the big screen, perhaps, or on a really decent quality version of it. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 I do recommend people searching it out. They're going to be screening it a few times in the UK at certain festivals. It's coming up uh, a couple of times, I think, um, before the actual uh, release um, so that people will have the chance to see Hellraiser on the big screen again. And I think, and, and the other thing is the, the amazing thing is I think about in the audience. It was a really full audience when we screened it at Fright Fest. There were twenty or thirty people who'd never seen the movie before. Yeah. Um, actually sitting in the audience, and I thought that was quite extraordinary as well. The fact that it has stood up the test of time, and st people are still wanting to come and see this movie that they've heard so much about. Yeah. Which is what will happen to rats. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People will be coming up and asking me for my autograph and say, you appeared in rats. <laughs> <laughs> and the feature. And the feature. And the feature. <laughs> now, um, then, speaking of rats, Nicholas, and we mentioned early, at the beginning of the interview, uh, you know, you play uh, the villain. I don't want to say if it's a villain or not, but quote unquote, the kind of not not necessarily a nice guy. And uh, since you are really a nice guy, what's that like for you to play kind of a slimy uh, character? Well, that's interesting. <laughs> Is he slimy? Well, I don't. I don't. Well, he said he was like. You don't, he's not read the script. Yet. I mean, it's, it's an, I'm with, I don't really want to. Is it, yeah. I think that's he a might very, be a nice guy, just well, kind of creepy. Oh, <laughs> well, that's fine. That's I fine. think the audience has got. I, um, this, you know, Mark can chip in as to what his view of because Mark and I talked about the character obviously, and mm -hmm. and until you know, once we're on set, then I think obviously we're going to find out more um, mm. about him in the way. But in my mind, I think, and one of the reasons I agreed, agreed to do the script, I think he's a likable character. Okay. You know, you you've got to you've got to because there's only a short film with a small cast, and I think it's he has to be likable um, for the audience to be invested. With. If he was a complete out and out slime ball mm -hmm. to begin with, I don't know that you'd be interested in what happens to him. Mm -hmm. No, and and uh, it is purposefully he's. I wouldn't. He's not an evil or a bad person. I think. I think what I would say is he's actually quite, quite a difficult person to perhaps easily get over to to the audience's likability. But here's the thing: if you're a, a guy in your like late fifties or even early sixties, and in a position of power, and you're having an ongoing relationship with with a woman far less than half your age. There's got to be something likable, I would say, mm -hmm. in you. There's got to be something charming in you. There's got to be... I mean, I, I've gone through this in drama school, as I'm sure lots of people have, and I've known uh, uh, drama school teachers or lecturers having relationships with the students. By students, I mean kind of people in their 20s or, or even you know late 20s, early 30s. But having those relationships, and I know there's always that kind of question of, well, well you shouldn't really do that, but it does happen, certainly in drama schools, and I've seen it. But they're very charming people. These aren't people I'd go, oh, they're horrible and they're disgusting and they're... Mm -hmm. I might not agree with what they're doing moralistically. Well, maybe not moralistically, but I'm, I personally may have an issue with what they're doing because it might. I see it as kind of a breach of trust. But, you know, it's legal what they're doing. They're both adults. They're both consenting. And if the person's not charming, then that younger person isn't going to be attracted to them. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I 
and kind of what I wanted and what I thought with Nick was that there was a huge likability with Nick. You know, anyone who's met Nick or chatted to Nick knows he's a, he's a wonderful guy who everyone loves and wants to kind of go up and hug. And I kind of wanted that <laughs> because actually this character as written is more of a difficult character to like. And the other thing that was important to me is I wanted, and, and this is kind of everything I've been writing, I've tried to have more mature characters. Because I think when you're younger, you don't kind of recognize how many horror films from kind of the 70s upwards rely on kind of teens or early 20s. And then you get yeah. to a certain age, like I am, mm -hmm. where you kind of go, a lot of horror films still, all of, all of the main characters are kind of now almost half my age. Yeah. And, and I think there's no reason why. I think the BBC did some some amazing adaptations of M.R. James ghost stories in the 70s mm -hmm. in their BBC ghost stories for Christmas. And the main characters in there were often uh, older gentlemen in their 50s, 60s, 70s. But you still had like, the, the chill going up your spine when you were watching these ghost stories. So I, don't, I think it's interesting to play about with, with the ages of your, of your main protagonists. Uh, and that's something I certainly uh, I'm really interested in doing, and this is why we do have, you know, as Jessica Messenger as, as a younger character, but actually our main two characters in this really are the Lawrence character and the Nick character, and and I think more people need to maybe start thinking about exploring. There's a huge wealth of talent of older actors out there, and there's an a, there's an awful lot of audiences out there. And we're all ageing. However, we're still going to see horror film festivals where half or more of all the stories we go and see are all kind of teenage, early 20s. Mm -hmm. And it's just interesting. And I, I get that the studios think it's the demographic thing, but I think it will change. I think it's another one of those things that are starting to change as time goes on. I think it's very interesting. One of the, I think, Mark, did you see We're Still Here with me? Yes. Yes. I think that was, again... It was because Barbara Crampton um, mm. were, was one of the leads in that. And it, again, it was a, about older older people, and it, it, was, and it was remarked on, I think, in some of the, one of the Q and A's um, that that's still unusual. And again, going back, just quickly folding back to Hellraiser, yeah, teen, no teenagers were harmed or killed mm. during the making of this movie. It, it, that was one of the things that made Hellraiser unusual for the time. You know, mm. coming after Freddy and uh, Halloween and so on, and the whole stalk and slash um, thing was that it was, a, as I say, it was about it was a story about adults. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because Julia was not young, young. Was no. she maybe in like her late thirties or yeah. maybe even yeah? yeah. Was, and that story was, works you know, wonderfully. Yeah, yeah and She's you know she's a, a very beautiful woman, but she's not that stereotypical hot chick. No, no, and I mean, obviously, you've got Kirsty played by Ashley Lawrence, and you know, it was one of the main protagonists in the movie. Um, in fact, is the heroine of the movie, and um, is, is just the heroine of the movie. Um, so, and it is part. It is interesting, I think, about demographics and so on. As Mark says, that I think your movie-going audience is actually getting older. You're actually getting grandpa. You know, grandparents do like to go to the movies still, um, or watch movies but not necessarily go to the movie theater but you know watching want to watch and be entertained by things and i do think the generation that uh where horror probably became more accessible that that generation is is aging i mean you know what i'm saying because there's yeah, people absolutely. that well, yeah I, I, one of the things i get at conventions is it's i always ask people were how old were they when they first saw Hellraiser? Uh, oddly enough, it's going up in age, weirdly. Um, it used to be, I'd say it was about 9 or 10, and it seems to have gone up to about 11 or 12. Mm. But it, when, it was nine or ten, when it was 9 or 10, probably about the last 10 years ago when I first started asking the question, this was because people were dared to see it by elder siblings. It was going right, you know, if you can watch Hellraiser, I'll give you $10. Um, it was either elder siblings or babysitters, which always fascinated me, the idea that babysitters were paying children to watch Hellraiser. Yeah, they don't um, have to deal with the fallout. They know what goes on after they leave. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but I, I think later on, more recently, it's HBO. 
and people having TVs in the bedroom that's got a cable connection. Um, so you could watch, you know, watch it. and you don't have to go to the video store anymore to rent your videos. You can get it piped directly into your laptop. Mm. Um, so I think, yeah, the demographics are changing. Yeah. In fact, it, you can't even go to a video store in most places. No, exist. no, you, you can't. Funnily enough, that brings me, that's a nice cue into the next show I'm doing this coming Sunday of, um, Straight to video, the B movie Odyssey. Have you guys come across this? No, no. That sounds great. Though. Ah, I do recommend. I do recommend it. Kevin Martin and uh, the co-directors are coming on. This is a web series uh, which features a performance by um, Tristan Risk. Um, it's coming out uh, next week or so. Uh, it's going to be online. Um, it's it's currently on VOD and it's going on to YouTube fairly uh, shortly. Um, and it's set in a video store. In fact, that's where I'm interviewing them in Kevin Martin's um, video store. And he says, desperately hoping. But it is all about a guy in a video store and who then betrays, in inverted commas, his video store and, and, and what happens to him because of that. So um, it is set in a video store. Um, you know, and it's about what happens to video stores and the fact that they're not. But it's actually really, really cool. I've seen the whole web series. They've done really a complete homage to uh, 80s movies. Um, and it's brilliant. It really is funny, but clever and uh, and, and full of heart and really interesting. And, um, and I would say that itself is going to draw, the, you know, we're talking about this older demographic because people are going to remember going into video stores and living through the death blockbuster and all those different things. Yeah, and, and it was interesting. I mean, Kevin, you know, reckons he's, he's, he reckons he's playing himself, you know, the grouchy video store owner. But Cody and Tim, I, I haven't actually met and spoken to him, but looking at the photographs, they don't look to be much out of their 20s if mm -hmm. they are out of their 20s. So I think there is still an audience there that is interested in that kind of thing. But it is, it is, basically everything is accessible, accessible mm -hmm. via the internet mm -hmm. these days. Yeah. I think that's actually why um, the practical effects are uh, really making a comeback. This is people who uh, grew up watching movies with practical effects are now making movies and they, they want, uh, you know, the stuff that they grew up watching in their movies. Hmm. As opposed well, it to looks the, better. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, there's also, you know, that's what they liked when, when, when uh, you know, when they were fans of movies, which I'm sure they still are, but, you know, and it's it's really made a comeback over the last few years. Well, it's very interesting. The um, it came up on my Facebook page the other day that there is a petition to get a release of the remake of The Thing, mm -hmm. which is effectively the prequel yeah. to The Thing, with the practical effects. That's a wonderful video. Anybody it's, who hasn't seen it, it's amazing what the thing looked like with the practical yeah. effects. And I heard that the studio just said, no, you can't do that because everybody wants CGI in a big studio. It, and, and, uh, you know, and, I, and I just think, why on earth would you do that? I mean, uh, to be honest, the film has far worse problems than the dodgy C than, than the CGI. <laughs> the lack of story, characterization, <laughs> and, and, and uh, actually it fell foul of all the things um, that the original movie managed to avoid, i.e., you've got an awful lot of men in an enclosed like, who dress similarly and look, mm -hmm. how do you make them distinguishable and interesting? Um, which he just doesn't do. Um, it's just not a good script. But I it, agree. the point that we're making about practical effects, there is something, it, it's something for the actor as well. I mean, I did some green screen stuff uh, for the first time recently. It's hard to do the green screen stuff yeah. if you've got. And you you don't know, you don't even have a door handle. You know, you're asked. You've got to imagine that it's a different form of acting, and it was really interesting. That it's um, for Borley Rectory with Ashley Thorpe, and I've seen what he's actually made out of the stuff that we did, um, and it looks stunning, absolutely stunning. Um, but it is it's tougher as an actor um, to be able to find that within yourself. So I'm really looking forward to working with the you know. Uh, facing a practical monster, I might regret it's saying it's that. It's <laughs> with a practical monster. <laughs> I wasn't talking about you, Mark. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you cut me but now that you mention it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're not wrong. I mean, I think that I, I'm not against. See, I, I know I kind of I do go on about saying this is all practical effects. I'm not against using CGI to enhance and tweak. And yeah. if you know, if you're using a puppet, I'm not against using it to take away, you know, the the inconvenient wires or, or you know sticks. Yeah, I think. The the problem is that even when you go back to stuff fairly recent history, you look at like the the Star Wars prequels. Now I know there's a lot wrong with the Star Wars prequels, mm -hmm. but just purely visually, if you look at the effects now, they don't stand up. No. And even if you look at like some of the stuff in Lord of the Rings, I know this is sacrilegious, but there's some stuff that never worked at the cinema, and I was a huge fan. But like the, the you know the the troll when they go under the mountain and stuff. Never worked, and any just about anything with Legolas in it never worked. <laughs> <It's like laughs> so I'm, I'm not a really big fan of all those battle scenes like um, Waterdeep, where they've just got this horde of CGI people running around. I, I, I think it's too. And the same thing with the Lucas stuff. It's very, uh, it's kind of like numbing just seeing the same. Th people just running all over the place in this big mess. I mean, I guess that's what war is, but I find it pretty pretty dull. I think your brain, there's something, I think there's something in your brain that tells you it's not real. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's the problem. There's something that they, they've never quite as much, I mean, you know, the stuff they did with Gollum was absolutely stunning, you know, but there was always something that wasn't, there wasn't quite enough weight, there wasn't yeah. quite enough of it interacting with it, it with its surroundings, and and that's the thing. If you've got a practical creature, you know it's actually got to move. It's got to, there's there's friction, there's gravity. All this stuff comes into play. That that I think they still struggle to kind of nail. And however close they come, unless they get a hundred percent, there'll always be something at the back of my game. That's not real, is it? <laughs> yeah, that's something we always bring up on the show. Is is the weight. It's like even in Avatar, which obviously looks great and everything. There is, it's still like when I was watching, like you could tell it, it's almost like you're watching a cartoon because you could tell that it's all it's not really there. Mm. I can tell you that even though Pacific Rim was so bad that Neil and I walked out, the reason we stayed as long as we did, for me anyways, is because they did a fantastic job with CGI. But that's giant monsters and robots. Yeah. So it's a little yeah. different. But again, because it looks, they look like toys to begin with. Yeah, Guillermo del Toro got he got what worked, and and I think he again they went back, didn't they, to a lot of those original kind of Ray Harry Horson and stuff, and it's kind of what works. How do you get that sense of scale when you've yeah. got something huge, but actually it's only fairly tiny, uh, or doesn't exist at all? And the rain effects and stuff like that, I, I think one of the reasons it really works in some of those sequences. Is they they just seem to get it right with the rain and the way the rain sort of bounces off the the robots. It just it just looks right. I know what yeah. you mean. I mean, I think there were some issues with the film. I loved it because it's giant robots and giant monsters. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen it. I have to. I've never got around to actually looking at it. I can't comment on that. <laughs> I'm uh, not. I'm not a fan of the story, but I'm not a giant robot actiony. No. Uh, oh my god. We saw Hannibal Chow, the Ron Perlman <laughs> character, and just laughed. Uh, <laughs> it's just so over the top and just laughed. I wrote down no because I, I I wrote I, I was like, that guy's really dressed nice. Yeah. He's he's very fancy. It's an it's a nice look that I I did not expect. <laughs> So uh, you guys also have uh, a Facebook page. It's uh, facebook.com backslash pages rats and then a bunch of numbers. But we'll have a link on the website or just look up rats. It's a lot easier to find. Cool. I'm so glad you didn't ask me what it was because I was going, oh, God, there's all those numbers. I'm going to get it wrong. <laughs> People are going to get on some sort of a dial an adult chat line. <laughs> oh, I got the numbers wrong. Old chat line with rats. Yeah. You, Mark. It's just a lot of uh, squeaking. Yeah, squeak. <laughs> Very sexy squeak. <laughs> squeak. Well, half halfway through, I'll continue with this. <laughs> halfway through me saying this that could you get know. a bigger audience. Who knows? Yeah, indeed. Squeak. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So and there's still there's still time to help 
uh, fund rats. Now it's going to happen if you don't meet the goal, but if, yeah. if people, if people donate, then you can, uh, do more that, you know, what you want to do with the movie. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. It's happening regardless. It's, um, I, I, ha I have a credit card that's ready to be buckled. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And um, no, it will happen regardless. It will. It every penny that we're getting in is basically going into, you know, enhancing the creature effects. Is going into kind of, you know, just just some practical stuff that people don't consider. We've got to kind of put up a cast and crew of probably moving towards thirty people now. This has turned into kind of the biggest thing I've done so far, mm -hmm. just for a short and. And so just all of that kind of stuff and all the practical things and, and all the travel and all the props and costume and stuff. And so, yeah, it will happen regardless. It's just it will be even better. <laughs> it will be even better with the money. And also you're buying into it. And any money that we don't use that we raise through this, which is unlikely, but if it does happen and we we break the, uh, the our target, then um, all of that will be going to submit into film festivals. To make sure that rats actually get seen, because I think that there's already a lot of interest. The great thing is at Fright Fest, everybody was talking about rats, and lots of people who I'd never met were coming up to me and going, "You, the guys doing rats?" And everybody kind of wanted to know what it was about, and that was just great. It's great that there's that kind of groundswell of interest. So, and that's part of what crowdfunding is. It's not just getting the cash, which is obviously really important. Mm -hmm. It's also Getting people engaged, getting people to go. Oh wow, there's this project out there with rats. And it's oh, it's got it's got Nicholas Vince in it. Oh wow, it's got Lawrence Harvey. It's got Jessica Messenger. Oh, it's it's shot in a real medieval castle. Oh wow, that sounds cool. Where can I see it? And it's it's creating that kind of vibe. And and I think crowdfunding is brilliant for that. And I think the only thing I'd say is maybe they should call it crowdsourcing, maybe yeah, more than yeah. crowdfunding, because I think there is this kind of stigma that's maybe just starting to creep in the idea yeah, of crowdfunding yeah. but we'll see we'll see where it goes but yeah very excited at the minute mm -hmm. has this been your first time uh using uh crowdfunding yeah yeah it has um I, and initially i was looking at maybe not doing it but as it's become a bigger and bigger project yeah. um it, it just kind of you know, I guess it's a bit like Tom Hanks and the Money Pit. It's <laughs> <laughs> and it becomes a bigger project. You go, oh, that's brilliant. We've got a bigger cast, and then you get, oh, we've got a bigger crew, and oh, we've got better effects, and you go, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, we, need, oh, we need another card. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's 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 been a wonderful wonderful ride so far, and it's just I'm, I'm so stoked that that many people really want to see the end product. Mm -hmm. um, and there are already there's so many people who desperately want to come to the set understandably and I'm like well we're going to be a little busy <laughs> and they're locking us in at night no. so for 12 hours it's, it's going to be like the haunting no one will yeah. come from town no one will live closer than that <laughs> <laughs> sorry Nicholas the first time I've heard I'm going to be locked in the castle <laughs> <tonight. laughs> That's really what this is going to be. It's going to be about you guys stuck in a castle yeah. <laughs> in the it middle was, of the night. I, I had what sounded like a brilliant idea to start with of, a, of an ultimate perk that would kind of be the whole budget for the film, which was someone coming onto set for the whole night and being there and kind of helping out with all the departments and getting to meet everybody and being in the castle. And then someone pointed out, what if that person turns up and then takes an axe out of their bag? <laughs> And I went, ah, yeah, okay, that's a different movie. <laughs> so we dropped that as a perk. Uh, <laughs> Nicholas is just nervously laughing in the back. Really? You were going to do that? <laughs> Nicholas is booking flights. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, yes, yes. <laughs> Well, we're definitely looking forward to uh, seeing it. And... and I did want to say real quick mm -hmm. before we go that, it, I mean, just listening to you guys laughing and everything, you could tell that people are having a lot of fun with this, it, that you care about it and it matters to you, but that you guys genuinely like each other. Yes. Stink. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing a great job convincing me. They're tr they are trained actors. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm barely trained. <laughs> 
Well, one, of the, one of the things that I've been doing with Chattering with Nicholas Vince is concentrating on independent filmmakers, um, and as you guys obviously do as well, you know, um, and supporting independent filmmakers and meeting independent filmmakers. I'm in the lucky position. I've then gone on to work with some of them, um, which, I'm, which I'm finding tremendously exciting. Um, Andy Stewart particularly. Katie Bonham, has not, who, who directed um, Mindless, um, hasn't been on the show yet, and I'm just we're just waiting for that to get to a slightly further stage before um, I can bring her on, you know, bring her on to the show because she's actually got to finish actually creating it, um, and so on. But the, the the reason I bring people onto the show is because I like and respect them. Yeah, uh, and I want to, you know, and I I want to work with them at, at some point during the future, you know, in the future. And I, uh, there's a real feeling that this is the next generation of actors in this, of, of, of sorry, filmmakers in this country yeah. as well. That through my show, I am actually beginning to meet all these wonderful people. That uh, Mark and I were talking about the Fright Fest family, um, mm. and some of the people, Liam Regan, who's already had banjo. Uh, which was at, shown at Fright Fest, and I'd met Liam a year or so ago on another independent movie, um, which I was acting on. Um, and I, th this is part to me is what makes my life really exciting and interesting is I do get to work with these very nice and interesting people. Yeah. Mark hates everybody. <laughs> it, 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 I, I He's think just in the background taking that. advantage. <laughs> yeah, well, I think. <laughs> I, I'd kind of, I, well, I definitely agree with what Nick says. There is, yeah. and, and at Fright Fest every year, and I've, I spoke to some of the organisers this year, and I said, you, you, you're kind of, there's a perfect storm brewing in that a lot of people who have been going to Fright Fest year after year after year after year, who through many different avenues have just got to a point where they're now all making their second or their third short film or their first feature, and all of this is turning into, certainly in the UK, a bit of a perfect storm where there's all these uh, directors and producers and, and actors that are just starting to just come through and just kind of get those first movies out and go onto the, the circuit. And, and they're going to have, you know, they're going to end up being kind of, oh my God, what are we going to put on? Because all these Fright Fest regulars, the, and, and Liam Regan's film was a perfect example. It was sold out. It was packed. Couldn't get anyone else in there. Brilliant reception. Now, that film, at that moment in time, I don't know about now, but had no distributor attached. Um, so it was an independent film that had been financed uh, privately and with crowdfunding. Uh, Liam had put his heart and soul into it. Got a huge reaction at Fright Fest. People loved it. Lots of people were talking about it and tweeting it out afterwards. And... It's just that they, you know, Fright Fest are starting to, and they did recognise this in the Q and A afterwards. We need to maybe start doing more of this and supporting grassroots talent who maybe haven't got a distributor attached yet, because yeah, actually yeah. we can see from the reaction of of the fans here that actually that's what people are wanting. People are wanting not just the latest studio movie that might be out on DVD or VOD in the next couple of weeks. It's kind of, well, show us something that we're not otherwise going to get a chance to see. Yeah. Um, and it's an it's a really exciting time to be in the UK as a filmmaker yeah. at the minute. And I, I just feel privileged to be working with all these people. It's just absolutely awesome. Mm -hmm. oh, Liam's film is called Banjo. I don't think we mentioned it. it's called it's Banjo. Look out for Banjo. I wrote that. I've written that down. What is Liam's last name? Regan. R-E-G-A-N. Check that out. Yeah, you guys have dropped a few a few great things down here for for films that you saw recently. So that's yeah, uh, yeah. That's that's cool. It is interesting because you guys are in like you're just uh, saying you know you're in this, but you really are finding so many good things yourself, and that must really help build everybody up to feel like these things are possible. It's not mm. just fighting the tide all the time. But it's a community, and it's the same, you know, with conventions. You really do get that sense of community and people supporting one another. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of uh, I, this is the first time I'd been to Fright Fest. Um, I've been out of the country for the last couple. Uh, I was I was there for the Nightbreed screening. We did the screening of the Cabal Cut a couple of years ago, but I was out of the country last year uh, and wasn't able to make it. Um, it was just such enormously wonderful atmosphere. 
um, and, you know, really had a great deal of fun just chatting to people, um, not necessarily film, filmmakers, but people who really want to come along and see this stuff mm-hmm. um, and, 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 you know, support people, this genre of, uh, of filmmaking. Extraordinary experience. I want to thank both of you for coming on tonight. It's been a pleasure to talk to both of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Absolutely. And very nice to meet you, Mark. Thank you. Nice to meet you both. Thank you. Thank you. And nice to meet you, Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> you say the sweetest thing. <laughs> thank you very much indeed, guys. Yeah, and we'll look forward to rats and... Uh, We'll be happy to have you guys back in the future. Thank you. Hi there. This is Barbie Wild, female Cenobite from Hellraiser 2 and author of The Venus Complex. You're listening to WithoutYourHead.com.